Hi, and welcome to Inside Indy. Okay, I have a question for the audience this evening. Do you have a savings plan? Guilty as charged, I don't. Uh, and we all need to, especially those who have a disability. Uh, so I want you to stay tuned because I would think this could be, the advice could be beneficial for anybody, but especially for those who are disabled in our community and here to uh, help us save and uh, have better ways of saving. Kelly Mitchell, you are our Indiana State Treasurer. I am. Welcome yes. to Inside Indy. Thank you. It's good to be here. What an honor to have such a high-ranking official from the state of Indiana here. This doesn't happen very often. I'm still working to get the governor here, but this is pretty cool. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I, I, I love it. I love it. You are here to talk to us about, it's, it's a, a special savings program for those with disabilities? Yes, absolutely. Called? It's, it's Invest Able. Invest Able. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the Able piece stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. Mm. So Congress passed this at the end of 2014, but each state had to create their own structure and their own program for an Able account. So we chose to call Indiana's Invest Able Indiana. Ah, okay. Okay. So how does it work? How can somebody take part in it? So to be eligible for this, um, Say you're um, a parent and you have a child with a disability mm -hmm. um, and that child receives means-tested benefits, so Medicaid, SSI, SSDI. Mm -hmm. In the past, you wouldn't be able to save more than $2,000 in their name without those benefits being suspended until that amount dropped below $2,000. Right. Okay. So now an ABLE account allows you to save up to $14,000 a year or up to $100,000 total at any one time in an ABLE account. Wow. Okay. So it's, in a way, it's protecting your funds or allows you, because before you couldn't really save as much, right? You really keeping... couldn't. You really couldn't. And we have heard from uh, self-advocates all over the state. So someone with a disability, we, we talked to a young man who has Down syndrome and he said, now I can save to get a place of my own. And he's never been able to do that yeah. before. And so now he'll be able to do that. Because then the pr pr uh, previous system was um, disabling the disabled in terms of their abilities to save and to to be more independent, which is really what, what they're aiming for. Yeah, it is. And it also gives parents peace of mind. I hear that a lot from parents. They can now save for their children. And uh, it goes a long way toward um, making them feel better that they're setting their children up in life for when they're gone and they're no longer there. Okay. Let's talk about, um, and we think of, when we say someone is disabled, that's, that's a very broad term. Absolutely. So, and those who are watching, I want them to understand who is eligible for that. So some of the different scenarios you mentioned, someone whose son or daughter is autistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of the other scenarios that... Sure. So um, one key thing to remember is mm -hmm. the onset of disability has to be before age 26. So it could be something you were born with. Um, perhaps you were born blind, or um, it could be something, an accident that happened in your 20s, and then you're on some form of disability, mm -hmm. SSI or SSDI or Medicaid. But if you qualify for those means-tested benefits and the onset of the disability happened before age 26, okay. then you're able to use an ABLE account. Okay, okay. What about any tax benefits to this particular savings account? Sure, so the dollars that go in are post-tax. So you've paid tax on the dollars, but while they're in an ABLE account, you have several options uh, mm -hmm. as far as investing your money, and you'll learn interest on those options. You, if Provided you take that money out for an approved uh, use, then you don't pay mm -hmm. taxes on the interest that's gained. So there's oh, a nice. tax advantage to it. Okay, okay, wow, wow. Um, now, who, let's talk about eligibility uh, requirements for those who are disabled. So anything that people out there who are watching need to know in terms of how, what would allow them to qualify or what might disqualify them. I know you mentioned the age issue. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and that can happen. I mean, something can happen at age 26, but mm -hmm. if you were 26 the week before, sadly, right now where it stands, you would not be eligible to use an ABLE account. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't qualify as far as you don't receive means-tested benefits or you don't qualify for them, but yet you can work with your doctor, there's a letter a doctor can provide, provided everything mm -hmm. um, is in order for that, and they, that can help you as well to open an ABLE account. Okay, okay. So let's go over again the details for viewers of how they can become a part of the savings plan 
for those who uh, have a disability. Absolutely, it's really mm -hmm. easy. We've made it an online process. You go to in.savewithable.com, mm -hmm. and it takes $25 as an initial contribution to open an ABLE account, and, and that's it. So oh, it's wow. very Just easy. Yes. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about you. Tell us about <laughs> you as our uh, state treasurer and where you're from. And I know you said you'd been in Indy for quite some time. Yeah, I've been in Indy since 2004. Uh, before that, I was in Cass County, Logansport. Okay. I used to be a Cass County commissioner up there for eight years. But nice. Really, I came to Indiana a, a long time ago uh, to go to Valparaiso University, and I just never left. Very nice, mm -hmm. very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, and obviously when we hear state treasurer, mm -hmm. you handle the money, but tell us about your role in the state and... Um, it's kind of cool having the, the person who has is over the money in the building. I love this. I love the energy. So, so what all do you? What is your role in terms of state government? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the treasurer in Indiana is the chief investment officer. So it's really my job to safely invest and oversee the public funds. And we have anywhere uh -huh. between five to seven billion dollars on a daily basis that we're keeping track of. Wow. But the state auditor is the chief financial officer in Indiana. So it's it's a unique. Uh, it works very well in Indiana. It's like a check and balance uh, uh -huh. for each other, and uh, it's a great system. It okay. works really well. Is there anything that you'd like to see for Indiana that's not in place right now or anything that you have an influence on in terms of that particular office or, or as far as for, for the money that you oversee? Well, so the, I say I'm the chief investment officer. That's mm -hmm. my constitutional role. But I'm also chair of four other uh, boards, and mm -hmm. I'm on about 12 others besides that. So there are a lot of different ways that uh, my office gets to influence uh, Hoosiers in a positive way. And so we have the College Choice Savings Account as well, the 529. Uh, I, I we chair, just did something on yeah, that recently. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I chair 911 for the state. I'm the only state treasurer in the country that gets to chair E911. Wow. And we have rolled out text to 911, just had our one year anniversary of our statewide text to 911 deployment. Uh -huh. So um, and I'm chair of the bond bank as well. And we do a lot of work with local government, which I love because I come from local government. Okay. Uh, so there's just a ton of ways, a ton of things that we do in Indiana. And I'm always looking at all of those and seeing what more can we do? What more, what can we do better? You know, how do we stay as relevant as we can to the needs of Hoosiers and to local okay. government? Okay. Okay. Well, you're doing a fine job. Well, thank you. And it's good to see a lady in that role, you <laughs> thank know, you. so yes. um, I really appreciate you coming in today and explaining to our viewers about this particular invest able, you know, yes. I wanted to call it investable, but and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I you know me, I'll change uh -huh. the name, but, um, wow, this is, this is really good and it, and encourages people, but those with disabilities, they have enough challenges. And so exactly. to see something like this available for them, this yeah. is very, very cool. Plan, provide, and prosper. Yeah. Invest able. Thank you yeah. so much oh, my pleasure. for joining us. Kelly Mitchell, our Indiana State Treasurer, for joining us on Inside Indy. And we'll be back with more after this. back here on Inside Indy. And, um, you know, in our community and really all over the nation, there have been some concerns uh, post-election about, oh, whether it's um, the attitudes of citizens toward one another. And, and it seems like things are starting to settle down. And um, But we want to talk about um, your civil rights from the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. We have a couple of people in the studio with us. We have Greg Wilson, who is the executive director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. Welcome, Greg, Thank to the you show. So much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Donisha Posey, who's the deputy director and general counsel for the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. All right. So people heard me say who you are. They may not truly understand what you do. Could you start off, Greg, by telling people about um, the commission? Uh, well, I will say this is that uh, one of the purposes of the commission is to eradicate discrimination, is to make sure that when people have issues where they think their civil rights have been violated, that they have a, an avenue to, to go to. They have 
an organization that will look into it and do the investigation to see what has happened. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, that's the important piece is that we're here to make sure that people's rights are protected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you want to add to that, Donisha? Sure. So um, the Indiana Civil Rights Commission is charged with uh, two different um, big pieces. The first is enforcement of the Indiana Civil Rights Laws. Um, so if someone feels discriminated against in their employment, housing, public accommodations, credit, or education based upon their protected class, so whether that's their race, religion, color, national origin, ancestry, familial status, um, things of that nature, um, they can call us and we can, um, like he said, enforce this in the civil rights laws. So that's one piece of what we do. And the mm -hmm. other big piece of what we do is educating the public on their rights, um, their civil rights, and also educating the public, also um, landlords, employers, the general public on their responsibilities under the Indiana mm -hmm. Civil Rights Laws mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I would think on both ends, whether yes. you're an employer, you don't, you may or may not know what you're supposed to be doing, and on the other end of it, as an employee, you may not know what's happening or if you're being discriminated. Right. You don't even know how to identify that. Exactly. So, so we're the neutral fact-finding party yes. um, from the state um, that we're here for. We're here for everybody. Okay. And here's the thing too: is what's important is you can report what you believe is discrimination and not be worried about retribution for the fact that you have reported this, what you believe that you've been discriminated against. I think mm -hmm. that's important because a lot of people don't understand that they have rights and then some people are worried about what if I do report this, this act I believe is discriminatory, uh, what happens to me? Okay. Now that that's a that's a good point. And so if I'm in the workplace and mm -hmm. I feel like I've been discriminated against, and I have not not, not here anyway, but anyway, that's another show. But, but um, how do you how do you do that? How do you complain and then you go to work the next day though? Because I would think even though they you're telling me they can't do anything to you technically, right? Yes. Is that, okay. So so what happens is if if you're not necessarily fired from your job, but maybe you were demoted or you didn't get the promotion that you feel like you should have based upon um, maybe your sex. Um, so if you file a claim with us, um, we have to let both parties know that a claim has been filed with us. Um, so once your employer has been made aware of that complaint, if there's any retaliation based upon you filing that complaint, um, that's another complaint that can be added to um, your case. Wow. Retaliation. Okay, because yeah, I would think the first thing is people would be concerned about retaliation. Yes. So, so we make sure that both parties know from the beginning that um, this is everybody's right to file a complaint, and that any retaliation after that um, is an absolute no-no, and we will enforce the civil rights laws based on that. Okay, but as we discussed earlier, sometimes someone may retaliate, not realizing that they shouldn't be doing that. Exactly. Right? Which, Again, as part of what you do is educating people. So what, what, what are people saying today? Because I would think there are even trends in terms of what people experience in terms of discrimination. So what are your typical calls? What are people saying today? What are they, what, what are they feeling discriminated about? Well, I, I say right now, we look at disability as mm -hmm. being the number one claim that, mm -hmm. that's been coming in. But just to kind of go back a little bit, and this is some of the reasons that we're trying to get out more is that a lot of people have or feel like they've been discriminated, but they're not sure where to go. Mm -hmm. And that is key. Uh, they're not sure where to go. I mean, while disability might be the top claim right now, there might be others uh, in other areas. It just hasn't risen to that level just because they haven't reported it. But currently it's disability and then the other focus is, is housing. I believe those are the, the two mm. main areas at this particular time. Okay. No, I would, I would completely agree with that. Um, disability in both employment and housing, yeah. um, especially in housing, um, because landlords and other property managers, they may not know all of the, um, the laws and statutes in place in, in terms of supplying a reasonable modification or an accommodation to, to someone's home. Um, so that's why education is key, and we are um, out across the state training, um, getting people the information that they need to know 
um, okay. in terms of that. So and partnering <laughs> with other human rights agencies as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, believe it or not, while we are the, the big footprint of the state civil rights organization, there are other civil rights agencies within different cities uh, that we partner with uh, to try to make sure that people know that uh, they have help even locally. Mm -hmm. when they, and if they can't get that specific help there, they can always come to the state. Okay. Let's talk about housing then, some, some, some scenarios. And let's try to educate people a little bit even here on the sure. show. So um, as a person who is looking to, um, say, rent a house, mm -hmm. so give me some scenarios that mm -hmm. people may not be aware of and they're being discriminated against. Sure. So that's the big issue with housing because people are typically not aware that they've been discriminated against until after the fact. Mm. So something that could happen... Um, you know, a grandmother um, is taking care of their grandchild and they are looking for an apartment They're looking to rent. Um, the landlord may say, oh, well, let's go around to the back uh, near the playground. That might be a better place for you to live. Um, so they might think, oh, I guess they're trying to be nice, trying to get us close to the playground. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that's steering, and that's trying to make someone live somewhere without giving them the opportunity to live wherever they'd like to live. Hmm. So that's okay. something small um, that people don't think about, but that is illegal discrimination. Hmm. Um, okay. And I would say another thing in housing, um, familial status is a big one. So like I said, if it was a, a grandmother and a grandchild or um, anyone who lives in the home that's under 18, if you... if you're not maybe allowed to um, live in a certain area of an apartment complex, or um, they flat out say, well, we don't want children here. It's, this is a quiet neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, illegal discrimination. Wow. Okay. You know, and I hate to say this, and I'm not, I'm not a landlord, but s some of that, you, you, there are reasons why people feel that way about it. I mean, sure. we can just take it out of, you know, the, the public domain, but even right. within our family, just certain family members that I may not <laughs> want to be bothered with their kids, you know, with what they do or, and, and so, and I'm not looking, you know, I, obviously I love my nieces and my nephews, right? So, right. Um, so I can understand where people would be thrown off by that sure. because you're protective of your, your property. Sure. No? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, please. No, I would just say that's why the education piece is so yes. important. Um, people, aren't aware of all of the Indiana civil rights laws, the federal fair housing acts, um, you know, all of the civil rights laws um, nationwide. So getting people educated and letting them understand that although this may not seem a big deal, it can be a big deal right. and it's, it's illegal. And, okay. it's, and for us, it's about education and enforcement. And I think you'll see more of that. I mean, we are willing to work with community organizations, uh, whomever to, to educate people about their rights, what their civil mm -hmm. rights are, whether it's in education, whether it's in housing, I think this is important. Okay. You mentioned protected classes. Can we mm -hmm. talk about that? Sure. So in order to file a claim um, of discrimination, you have to feel that you've been discriminated against based on your protected class. So that could be your race, your religion, your national origin, your ancestry, your color, um, your familial status, your sex. Um, I think that's, um, mm -hmm. okay. those are all the protected Protecting. classes. Okay. okay, wow, okay, and the complaint process, how does someone initiate? But one thing, complaint? even before you get to the complaint process, mm -hmm. that I think people have to understand, you have to document these actions. Mm -hmm. The best thing ah. that you can do is document what's happened, who did it, Times, dates. Mm -hmm. The most, the more information you have, the the better it'll be for us to to look at this. And if it is discrimination, to prove that a lot of the work is going to be on you mm -hmm. because you know what happened. You know who the person is. Even if you saw this person treated this way, who's of one race, and then mm -hmm. you're in that protected class and you're treated this way, but you've got to document that health because a lot of times people come in, they want to file the complaint, but you don't have anything to go mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying at some point the person goes, okay, something's not right here. Yes. And then, of course, the, the initial reaction is, okay, to complain, but you're saying they need to slow it down and say, okay, if it's happening and probably on a consistent basis, either start retrieving past information 
and or from that point on start documenting? Yeah, yeah, well, some of the information, of course, by an investigation, you're going to find some things. Mm -hmm. But at the, it makes it a lot easier and it makes your, your case more provable if you can document document as much as you can about what happened, who and times and the situation, because basically you're bringing something to the table about this event mm -hmm. that you feel like you've been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then when you have that information, then you bring and file your complaint. Right. Okay. So just to talk to you about the complaint process, um, someone calls in and our number is 317-232-2600. They can call us. They can file a web inquiry um, on our website. That's mm -hmm. um, in.gov slash ICRC. Um, file a complaint with us, or they can even walk into our office at 100 North Senate Avenue room in 300. Um, so they, they, file a, they, they tell us that they want to file a complaint. Um, they'll talk to our intake specialist um, who will re uh, retrieve all of the information necessary to start the complaint process. So they're... Um, information, you know, where they live, um, who the respondent is. So, you know, maybe I work at ABC Company. Mm -hmm. um, so we get all the information about that. We ask you what happened. Well, I've been working at ABC Company for five years. I have a lot of experience. However, um, this new guy who just started two days ago got the promotion over me, and I felt like it's because of my religion. Mm -hmm. um, so after we get that information and you sign that complaint, then it goes to our investigation team to go out and investigate on your wow. behalf. So we will talk to you. We will talk to your witnesses. We'll talk to the other side and their witnesses. Right. Um, we'll get documentation. Um, you know, if you're saying that you have the experience, we'll get your resume. We'll get your work history. We'll get it for the, for the other guy who you said didn't have the uh, credentials. Mm -hmm. um, after the investigation is complete, um, we will make that determination of whether we believe there is cause or no cause that discrimination occurred. If um, we determine that there is cause for discrimination, then um, our staff attorneys will litigate the case on behalf of the, the public's interest. Wow. So the public's interest is to eradicate discrimination, as right. you said. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, now we have a case, it can go in front of our administrative law judge or the parties can elect to go to state court. Wow. Um, so it's a very robust um, process that we have, um, but it's in the best interest of the state and um, our commissioners have the final authority um, mm -hmm. when it comes to um, the final decisions in those cases. Wow. wow. Just to remember <laughs> though, is that some things can seem like discrimination, but it could also be this is just a bad person. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah. and, and, and you have that. And so that's what I said that it's documented, trying to get a pattern exactly. for what's happened versus just knowing that Joe is just a horrific person. Or mm -hmm. again, like you said earlier, some of them don't know all the laws dealing with ADA Act mm -hmm. and things like that. Right. Okay. And I think, I would think that a lot of the, especially employers, and, and landlords are just probably dumbfounded when mm -hmm. they, and it, I would think that most of the time they don't really see it. Even though they've lost, it's, you got the evidence, they don't get it. Like yeah. they don't, am I right? It's yeah. It's probably the case. Yeah. Okay. And the great thing about our agency is that we do have mediation services that we provide for free for the parties. Okay. So, so that, go that, you know, way. like let's not even go into litigation. We didn't realize you know, we made this mistake. Let's let's rectify this right here and right now. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Will you come back? Of course. Yes, to continue course. this discussion and talk about other things that are going on in the community. But I appreciate you coming in. Greg Wilson, thank the you. executive director appreciate for the it. Indiana Civil Rights Commission, and Denisha Posey, who's deputy director and general counsel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. On thank you so Inside much. Indy. And thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.